California Native Plan Society, the San Gabriel Mountain Chapter. The organization is made up around 30 chapters all over California and even one in Baja, south of us. Our mission is to conserve California native plants and the habitats to increase understanding of the flora and preserve it for the generation of us humans and all the animals that depends on those habitats. We also like to acknowledge that we live on the native people's land, the, the people that lived here before us and pay our respect to those. Um, hi everyone, it's so great to see your names. I wish we were seeing your faces also. Um, and uh, I'd love for everyone to just put your name and city in the chat so we know where you're from. I know some of you are from farther than others. And, um, and uh, tonight's uh, presentation is, is going to be lovely. I've seen it once and I have a lot more to absorb. So uh, Chris Cosma studies the effects of climate change on moths and butterflies. Um, he's a PhD candidate um, in all these things, evolution, ecology, and organismal biology. Um, uh, but my favorite thing is that we all listened to Doug Tallamy's talk in 2018 at the, at the CNPS conference. And you know that another conference is coming up in October, so please plan for that. Um, but Chris looked at it and, 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 um, and Doug Tallamy admitted that um, for California, the data weren't that good. So Chris decided, well, he would make his own tool for the data for California. And I, and I love this. So please stay to the end um, so that you can see how to use that tool. It's still, I think, in beta. Um, and please hold your questions to the end. Rebecca Shields Moose will and will collect all your questions. So if they probably won't be answered at the time you ask them, but they will be collected for the end. So um, without further ado, um, uh, Chris, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Thanks so much, Orphy. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for the invite. I'm super happy to be here and to share with you all um, some stuff that I've been doing to advance lepidopter conservation in California. And, and really what this talk is mostly about is the things that we can all be doing to, to help in this important task. And like um, Orchid said, a, a lot of this is inspired by the work of Doug Tallamy, and I'm, I'm glad that some of you were able to see his talk. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about his studies throughout this talk as well. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So a little bit of background about myself before I begin. Um, as Orchid said, I'm a PhD candidate at UC Riverside. Um, and I study ecology in the ecology, evolution, and organismal biology department. Um, and I'm in Dr. Nicole Rafferty's lab. So here's our lab group pictured here. You can learn more about the research that we do by visiting our lab website, which is listed down here in the left. Our PI, Dr. Rafferty, is here in the middle. So everyone in our lab studies some aspect of the effects of climate change on mutualisms. And mutualisms are just the ecological interactions in which both partner species benefit. And probably the most well-known mutualism that I'm sure you are all familiar with um, is the interactions between plants and their pollinators. And that's probably also our most popular study system within our lab as well. But we also study other mutualisms such as the below ground mutualisms between plants and mycorrhizal fungi. And so my research in particular focuses on moth pollination, which is a type of pollination that's a little bit less studied than bee pollination or even butterfly pollination, but that I'll be talking to you about today that is super important. Um, maybe And so throughout the talk today, I'm going to be painting a picture of moths, not as these annoying pests that eat our clothes and the food in our pantry and fly into your face and around your lights at night. 
but instead as important components of our ecosystems, serving as important pollinators of our wild and agricultural plant species, as well as important food sources for birds, bats, and other organisms. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to start out with some bad news and I'm gonna try to get this out of the way. But the bad news is that insects across the world are not doing so well. Um, so you may have seen the headlines, or read the headlines like this one from the New York Times in 2018, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? And so I don't wanna downplay the severity of this situation because the fact is that insects are in trouble. A recent report from 2019 found that 40% of insect species worldwide could be extinct in the next couple of decades. And so this is the main figure from that paper that's just showing the proportion of species in each of these insect groups. So we have all the major insect groups here on the bottom, including our butterflies and moths here in these second and third to last bars the proportion of those species that are in some sort of decline. So whether they're declining uh, in the blue listed as vulnerable or endangered in the orange and the yellow, or in fact extinct in the gray. And we can see that across the board, no insect group is safe. And, and all of these groups of insects are suffering some sort of decline. And in particular, if we focus our attention on butterflies and moths, the groups that I study, we can see that over 60% of species here are endangered, vulnerable, declining, or in the case of butterflies, extinct. Sorry, my video is lagging a little bit. Okay, so zooming in on Lepidoptera, in particular moths, a study from the UK found that there's been a 40% decline in moth abundance in Britain since 1968. So this is the main figure from that paper that's just showing this downward trend through time in, in moth abundance. And here's one of their focal species, the Sussex emerald. And so moths, as, as well as other insects, are not doing so well. But I did want to offer a glimmer of hope, at least for us here in the United States, because a lot of these studies, like the one I just showed from the UK, are coming from Europe, um, where they have a history, a, a much longer history of intensively human ma managed landscape. So humans have been there for much longer, destroying their ecosystems in the various ways that we do for longer than, than we've been in the US. And so a lot of these studies of widespread insect decline have been coming from those parts of the world. Recent studies from the United States have suggested that insect populations here appear to be relatively more robust than in Europe. So that is good news. But what it really means is that we are in a critical stage of insect conservation in the US. We have a chance here to prevent the worst from happening, to prevent our insect population from following the same path that they have in the UK and other parts of Europe. And that's made ever more critical by the fact that several taxa are unambiguously in decline right here in the United States. And that includes butterflies and moths. So a study on butterflies in the Western US found that there's been about a 1.6% annual reduction in butterfly abundance over the last four decades. So every year you have 2% less butterflies flying around out there. And that includes common species like this West Coast lady that's pictured here. And I'm gonna circle back to this idea about of common species being vulnerable and threatened as well. And so a little bit closer to home here for a lot of us, if we're in Southern California, 18% of butterfly species in Griff Griffith Park, which is one of the largest urban parks in the state in Los Angeles have gone locally extinct in the last century. 18%. And so we know Lepidoptera are declining. Why do we care about it? Well, I probably don't have to spend a lot of time convincing all of you why we care about insect decline and why it's bad news for our ecosystems and for people as well. So I'm gonna go into a couple of examples about how Lepidoptera decline, butterflies and moths decline in particular is really bad news. And so the first reason is that Lepidoptera are one of the most diverse insect orders. 
So here's a phylogenetic tree that's just showing the evolutionary relatedness between organisms. And what we see here is that we have so many different groups of butterflies and moths. And in fact, in, in North America alone, we have 13,000 species of Lepidoptera. And there's probably a lot more than that. There's tons of undescribed species out there. And something I like to point out, a lot of people are not aware of this, is that 95% of Lepidopter diversity, so 95% of the species in this insect order are actually moths and not butterflies. Um, and so what we see here in this phylogenetic tree, the highlighted portion is the small subset of Lepidopter that are butterflies. And there's actually a joke among people that study Lepidopter that butterflies are actually just day flying moths. Because when we look at it from an evolutionary perspective, we actually see that indeed butterflies are just a small group of Lepidopter that have evolved to be day flying instead of nocturnal. And so another reason why Lepidopter decline is really bad is because Lepidopter are super important to our ecosystems. Um, and so I'm going to be focusing on two life stages, the larval life stage when Lepidopter are important herbivores and the adult life stage when Lepid Lepidopter are important pollinators. And so I'm going to go through the Lepidopter life cycle here just to jog your memory. And these are going to be pictures of the monarch butterfly life cycle because it's probably our most well-known example. And so we start with the egg that's deposited on our host plants. We have the larval stage, which we more commonly refer to as the caterpillar when they're important herbivores in our ecosystems. We then have the pup pupil stage, which we call the chrysalis or the cocoon. And then we have the adult stage. And in this adult stage, the Lepidoptera act as important pollinators. All right, so I wanna bring to attention this idea of important herbivores. Cause some of you are maybe scratching your head asking, you know, how can something be an important herbivore? Aren't herbivores bad for our plants? They eat our native plants. Well, we know that Lepidopter in their larval stage as caterpillars eat plants and are herbivores. But we also know that as larvae, Lepidopter serve as really important food sources for birds and other vertebrates. And in fact, in these two stages as herbivores and as prey for birds and other organisms, Lepidoptera transfer more energy from plants to other animals than all other herbivores combined. So I'm gonna go into this idea a little bit further here. And, and really the main point is here is that herbivory is a good thing for our ecosystems. It fuels our terrestrial food webs. And so if we look at the Lepidoptera as a caterpillar again. We know that it's eating these plants. It's taking that plant energy up into its body. That energy is then assimilated into the next trophic level by the birds or the other organisms that eat these caterpillars. And that energy then in turn is transferred into the higher level predators that may eat those birds and other animals. And so we see from this example, the energy that started in the plant and was transferred from that caterpillar to that bird, to that higher level predator, um, this caterpillar makes that transfer of energy possible. And another important thing to remember about Lepidoptera is that they of course transform into our adult butterflies and moths. And in that, in that adult stage, they also serve as really important food sources. And in the case of moths, particularly for our native bat species. All right, so a couple more specific examples about how important Lepidoptera are for our food webs. Caterpillars can make up to 90% of the diet of some of our native songbirds. And so this is some of the work of Doug Tallamy that I was mentioning. He's done a lot of work on how important butterflies and moths are to our terrestrial food webs. And I highly recommend you checking out his research and also some of the books that he's written. And then again, in their adult stage, moths are really important food sources for bats. And in fact, some bats are what we call moth specialists and almost ex exclusively eat moths. And so in light of these facts, it's, it's no surprise that Lepidoptera declines have been linked to declines in our native songbirds as well as our native bat species. So another study by Doug Tallamy's group found that 
insectivorous birds, so birds that um, heavily rely on insects in their diet, have declined by 2.9 billion individuals over the last 50 years. And when we compare that to non-insectivorous birds, so birds that don't rely heavily on insects, those groups of birds have actually increased by 26.2 million individuals. So we see this dramatic difference between the trajectory of bird populations that rely on, on insects that have been declining and the trajectory of ones that don't heavily rely on insects that have actually increased. All right, so I've shown you how important Lepidoptera are in their larval stage. So now let's transition over to thinking about Lepidoptera in their adult stage. And as adult butterflies and moths, we know that Lepidoptera are really important pollinators. And most of the credit here is given to butterflies. So we all know that butterflies are flying around during the day, visiting our flowers, pollinating our plants. But a growing amount of research is showing that moths are actually also really important pollinators of both wild and agricultural plant species. And so looking at the agricultural plants that have recently been studied, um, some studies have shown that moths pollinate things like avocados and berries and apples. And although I can't really find wide support for this in the literature, I captured this video in my own backyard a couple months ago of a moth pollinating my orange tree right in my backyard here in Riverside. And so although it's less studied, moths are clearly very important to our own food supply, just as bees and other daytime pollinators are. So just like bees and butterflies are flying around pollinating our plants during the day, moths are doing the same thing by night, even though we're not awake usually to see them. Oops, I'll play that again. All right, so they're important for agricultural, but we also know right here in Southern California that moths are really important pollinators of some of our wild plant species. And so there's the yucca yucca moth interaction. That's a really famous example of coevolution that served as a study system. We have hawk moth pollination of datura species, evening primrose species, and even agave species. So these are just some of the more well-known examples of moth pollination from this part of the, the earth. And in, in my research and that I'm not gonna be talking about today as much, I go out to our Southern California habitats and I trap moths with these light traps that I designed. So here's some of those moths caught in my trap. And then I identify those moths. And here are some more of those uh, of our local moths here in Southern California. We have Hylis lineata, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, one of the most common hawk moth species. And we catch some really, really cool looking moths and really important moths in these ecosystems. So here's one of, another one of our, our hawk moth species, Manduca rustica. And we have tons of these really bright and beautiful uh, tiger moth species as well. All right, so in the other part of this research, I bring these moths to the lab and I take the pollen that's on their mouth parts and I analyze it with genetic techniques to determine which plants they're actually pollinating. And so here are some pictures of pollen grains stuck on the proboscides of moths. And so far in this research, I've found that over 50% of moths in our Southern California habitats are transporting pollen. And these aren't just the hawk moths, these more well-known pollinators. These are these everyday gray moths that are flying around your porch lights at night. They're out there, they're pollinating, they're helping our wild plants and probably also our agricultural plants. All right, so we've seen that Lepidoptera are super important for our ecosystems, for our food webs, possibly even for our own food supply. And so we need to conserve these really important organisms and doing so requires an understanding of why Lepidoptera have been so impacted by global change. And a lot of the answer comes down to the reason why any group of insect is declining right now. And those include things like habitat destruction, climate change, pesticide use, invasive species. And in the case of moths in particular, we have sort of a unique threat, which is light pollution. 
So here's a map of light pollution in the United States. And we can see that California in particular is a hotspot. We have a lot of development, a lot of artificial lights at night here in California. And light pollution has been shown to be really, really bad for moths. It disrupts things like their mating and feeding behaviors, and it increases their risk of predation at these light sources, which they're attracted to. And so I'm not going to be talking about light pollution so much in this talk, but I do highly encourage you, if you can, to turn the lights off outside, if you can turn off those porch lights or those landscaping lights whenever you can, um, that would be a huge help for our native moth populations. All right, so Lepidoptera are impacted by all of these global change factors, just like any groups of insects. But one of the reasons why they've been a bit more heavily impacted, so those bars show that over 60% of species are being impacted. Um, and part of that reason is that Lepidopter rely very closely on native plant resources at each stage of their life cycle. So I'm going to come back to this Lepidopter life cycle here. And we see that eggs are deposited, uh, deposited on our native host plants. And the monarch is a perfect example of this. The monarch butterfly we all, need, we all know needs its milkweed. So it, deposit, it deposits its eggs on the milkweed. The caterpillars are highly specialized on their host plants. And I'm gonna be talking about this idea of ecological specialization more in this talk. Even things like chrysalis and cocoon placement requires native plant resources. And then of course, our adult butterflies and moths drink flower nectar and native plants have been shown to be more attractive to them. And so all of this is to say that Lepidopter need, need native host plants, and they also need native nectar plants. And so host plants are just the plants that are eaten by the larval Lepidopter, so the caterpillars. And our nectar plants are just the plants that, they, that are visited by adult Lepidopter when they're searching for that nectar that they drink. And in the process, they're pollinating those plants. And the key word here really is native. So I really like this definition of native from Rick Dark and Doug Talamy from The Living Landscape, a plant or animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. And so the part of this definition that I want to draw attention to is this idea of coevolution. So complex and essential relationships being developed between plants and animals in an environment. And it's these relationships that can tell us a lot about what these plants and animals need. And so coevolution between native plants and herbivores is what's led to this diet specialization in their caterpillar stage. And so Lepidopter, again, as, as caterpillars are herbivores. And so so going back to this idea of ecological specialization, just to give you some context, specialists are just organisms that can only rely on a few types of resources. So for example, a caterpillar that can only eat a certain plant species, whereas an ecological generalist are species that can rely on many types of resources. So maybe a caterpillar that can eat dozens of types of plants. So the vast majority of caterpillars and other herbivores are specialists. And so again, this coevolution between native plants and herbivores is what's led to this diet specialization. Plants don't want to be eaten, and they have defenses that deter herbivores. These include chemicals like nicotine and tobacco plants. Over thousands of generations of interacting with a particular plant species, caterpillars have evolved to circumvent that plant's specific defenses. But in the meantime, they still remain vulnerable to all the defenses from all the plants that they have not co-evolved with. So they're very specialized on those plants that they have co-evolved alongside. And because of this co-evolution, we know that 90% of plant-eating insects are host plant specialists. And this includes other insects besides uh, Lepidoptera, so beetles, Hemiptera, a bunch of different types of insects. And so it's no surprise that native plants support up to 15 times more native Lepidoptera species than introduced and ornamental plants. 
And so it's really not good that most of our landscaping in urban and suburban areas look something like this. We have introduced grass species that cover the majority of our yards, uh, providing almost no resources for native insects. We have introduced shrubs and trees, again, providing no resources and no value to our native insects. And in fact, most of the plants that we use for landscaping are non-native introduced species. So a study in Portland, again by Doug Tallamy and his group, found that 92% of trees in Portland neighborhoods, so just the trees that are lining our streets in our neighborhoods, are introduced and not native to that area. And the same goes for Southern California and other parts of California and all across the country. This is just a study that I could find this, this statistic here, 92%. That's frankly unacceptable if we want to be supporting our native insects. And so another reason I'm drawing attention to this idea of specialization versus generalization is because we know that specialist species are at greater risk of extinction under environmental change. So habitat destruction, climate change, all of those anthropogenic changes that are occurring in our environments. And that's because specialist species are more easily uncoupled from their native plant resources. And so as a quick example of this, let's say we have an ecological generalist. This is a caterpillar that can rely here on you know, 10 native plant species. The loss of any one of those plant species is unlikely to affect that caterpillar because it has so many alternative host plants that it can rely on. And so that caterpillar is probably going to be fine. But instead, when we look at our ecological specialists, and again, the majority, 90% of insect herbivores are specialists, relying on just one or a few native plant lineages. The loss of that same plant species is going to heavily affect that specialist because it's the only plant it can rely on. And so it's no surprise, again, that Lepidoptera declines have been shown to be driven by the loss of hosts and nectar plants due to habitat destruction, climate change, and other factors, including right here in California. So a series of studies, again, showing that butterfly decline in California is driven by the loss of these hosts and nectar plants. So what can we do about it? And so that's hopefully the end of most of the bad news in this talk, and I want to transition into talking about the positive things. What can we do about insect decline, lepidopter decline? And the first thing I want to um, ask you to take a moment to think about is when you're selecting plants for your yard, your garden, maybe you work on habitat restoration projects, what are the things that you're thinking about? What are the priorities that go into selecting those native plants? So take a moment to think about that for yourself. And some of the things you might think about are ma maintenance requirements. So how much upkeep is this plant going to take? Can it be self-sufficient? Water use efficient, efficiency, that's a huge thing in California. Are you thinking about benefits to native wildlife? Are you thinking about the reduced need for pesticides? Are you thinking about aesthetics? Or maybe there's something else that you're thinking about. So the reason I want you to think about this is because the answer to this question, what can we do about Lepidopter decline? And we know this from the example of the monarch butterfly, it's plant native plants. Planting native plants is the single most important thing anyone can do, the average person to the professionals to conserve Lepidopter. And so the monarch butterfly was at risk, so we planted the milkweeds. But when we look at it from a community perspective and the list of threatened or endangered Lepidopter species grows, we can see that the number of native plant species that we need to support those Lepidopter species also grows. And so it's not just the monarch that's at risk, it's all of these Lepidopter, it's the entire community of moths and butterflies that we need to be focusing on conserving here. And so there are many more native plant species than just the milkweed that we need to protect. And so transitioning from this, this perspective of individual species and individual interactions to more of a community level perspective requires a way to look at that. 
And the way that I do that in my research is looking at ecological networks. And ecological networks just describe the interactions between entire communities of plants, and entire communities of insects. And so here we have a plant herbivore network. The caterpillar herbivores connected by lines representing their herbivory interactions with these native plant species. And so analyzing these sorts of ecological networks can tell us a lot about how important and vulnerable species are. And this can help us um, prioritize plant and insect species for conservation. And so we can identify specialist insects that rely on few native plant resources like the monarch butterfly. But we can also identify those plant species, those generalists that have many interactions in the community and therefore are supporting many of these insects. And so that plant herbivore network can tell us a lot about which plants and which caterpillars we need to protect. But again, remember that Lepidoptera require native plant resources at each stage of their life cycle. So it's not just the caterpillars that we need to think about. We also have this really important adult stage where they are relying on nectar from native plants. And studies have shown that diet breath, which is just the number of interaction partners, uh, the number of species that, uh, that an organism relies on, um, in the larval and adult stages are significant and independent determinants of Lepidopter extinction. So these extinctions that have been occurring, we have to look at their diet in their larval stage, but we also have to look at their diet in their adult stage. And so this is telling us that conservation efforts should consider plant resource dependencies at each life stage. And so as a quick example of this, let's say that we, again, have a adult moth or butterfly, um, which is a generalist. So a lot of pollinators are more generalists. They're relying on many plant resources. So if we just look at this pollination stage, this adult stage, we may think that this moth is going to be fine if any of those plant species is lost because it has all of these alternative plants to rely on. But if we look at that same moth species in its larval stage, so here's that same moth, but just as a caterpillar, and it's an ecological specialist relying on just one or a few plant species, then we can see that that species overall is much more vulnerable than we would expect from just looking at one, one stage and one interaction type. And so one of the ways we can look at these interlinked dependencies is by studying what's called multi-layer ecological networks. And these just link networks of different interaction types. So in this case, we have our herbivory network, our caterpillars feeding on their native host plants. And we also have our pollination network, those adult, or those adult butterflies and moths uh, pollinating and drinking the nectar of these native plants. And in the case of Lepidoptera, these networks can be linked by shared insect species. So caterpillars that are herbivores of native plants in their larval stage and, and pollinators of native plants in their adult stage. But they can also, of course, be linked by these shared plant species. And a really good example here in, in California, and this is my bias of moth pollination speaking, but we have Datura which is both herbivorized by our hawk moths, our native hawk moths, but it's also pollinated by those native hawk moths as their adults. And so to study and analyze these sorts of dynamics, I've been using a resource that's called California Plants as Resources for Lepidoptera. And this is a naturalist guide to interactions, pollination and herbivory between native plants and Lepidoptera across the entire state of California. And it includes both butterflies and moths. And this is available on several of the CMPS websites if you're interested in, in looking at this guide. And so some of the things that we found by analyzing this data is that caterpillars indeed in he here in California are much more specialized than adults. So our caterpillars, our herbivores, have an average of 3.6 interactions per species. Whereas our adults, uh, our, our adult butterflies and moths have an average of 14.7 interactions per species. 
And that same specialization makes caterpillars much more sensitive to simulated plant extinctions than adults. So here I, um, I simulated some losses of plants from these networks. So I took out plants and I showed mathematically and in a computer simulation what that did to the rest of the species in that network. And we found that on average, it only takes 1.4 plant extinctions to drive one caterpillar extinct. So one, one and a half plants gone means that one of our caterpillars is gonna be lost. Whereas if we look at the adult stage, our pollinators, it takes an average of 6.25 plant extinctions to drive one adult extinct. So we see that caterpillars are much more sensitive to these plant extinctions. It takes much less plant extinctions, extinctions to drive our caterpillars extinct. And this is important because a lot of conservation efforts focus on just one life stage. For example, butterfly gardens that provide uh, resources for adult butterflies, so nectar plants. But what this research is telling us is that lepidopter conservation must include protecting native nectar and host plants. And so this idea that without the caterpillar, you don't get the butterfly or the moth. And vice versa, without our adult Without supporting our adult butterflies and moths, we're not gonna get new generations of caterpillars. So what we're seeing in this data is that caterpillars are really picky eaters. They're much more specialized than their adult stage. And so we have to be picky in choosing which native plants to provide them. And so what I'm saying here is that we need herbivore gardens too. We can't just have those pollinator gardens. We need to provide these larval lepidoptera with their native host plants, or else we're not gonna get those butterflies and moths flying around. And so the question is, how do we do that? How do we determine which plant species to use in our yards, our gardens, our restoration products? And answering this question requires confronting an unfortunate reality. And that's that we can't save everything. And so we saw from that study that I presented earlier, 40% of insect species worldwide could be extinct in the next couple of decades. And could be, that's a strong word. What does that mean? Well, it really depends on what we do now. And so a better question perhaps is how do we prioritize plant species for lepidoptera conservation, knowing that we can't save everything? And some of this comes down to the, de the debate um, and different thoughts on what sorts of species we should be focusing on protecting. Should we focus on protecting rare specialist species or should we perhaps also focus or perhaps even prioritize protecting common generalist species? And so a lot of conservation in the United States has focused on protecting those rare specialist species. So our monarch butterfly that was declining and that was a specialist relied just on these milkweed plants. Right here in Southern California, around Riverside, we have our federally listed endangered Kino checker spot butterfly, a rare uh, butterfly that again is an ecological specialist, relies on just a few native plant species. But as I showed earlier, common generalist species are also at risk and they're also declining. And in the case of common generalist species, they may be providing broader benefits to ecosystems. And so one of those examples is our West Coast lady. Populations have been severely declining in California. This is a common species. It's found almost everywhere. It's a generalist, um, but again, it's at risk and we, without protecting it, we risk losing these broad benefits that it's providing in our ecosystems. And so I don't have the answers to these questions. Should we focus on protecting rare specialist species or common generalist species? But a couple of thoughts um, maybe to inspire discussion um, is that the answer probably depends on the context. So should the goals of conservation and restoration professionals differ from those of the average home or landowner? And what is the maximum difference that the average person can make in our yards, our gardens? And so what I've come to in my research in the context of using native plants to support Lepidoptera, what I've arrived at is that we really need to start focusing more on these generalist plants that support many species of Lepidoptera in the community. 
And this was supported by research. So another study by um, Doug Tallamy's group, Naringo et al. 2020, they found that in the US, just 14% of plants support 90% of Lepidoptera species. So we need to identify which plants those are, which are the plants or native plants that are, are providing the most resources, supporting the most number of species. And so what I've done in my research and developing this tool that I'm about to present is I focus on identifying what we call keystone species in our networks. And so the, the idea of keystone is that there's just some species that are disproportionately important for the entire community like the keystone and Roman arches. Without that, the entire community, the entire arch falls apart. And so what I've done to identify these important species is I've analyzed what's called network modularity. And modularity is just the tendency of groups of species within our whole network to form compartments of more closely interacting species. And so let's say that this is our whole network here we have these modules that are the shaded regions that are just these groups of species that interact more closely with one another. And within these modules, two important roles have been proposed. What are called module hubs, which are pictured here in the red. And these are just species that are highly connected within their modules. And then we have our module connectors. So these are just species that connect different modules with one another and they maintain the integrity the integrity of the entire network. And importantly, the loss of these module hubs and connectors is predicted to lead to cascading extinctions within and across modules. So losing these species is really bad for the whole network. If one of these species is lost, probably a lot more species are gonna be lost as a result. And so this is a big complicated figure and it's, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on explaining it, but what I found by analyzing this data set is that for about 50% of species are only important in one network and not the other. So I've analyzed this network modularity and I've identified how important these species are as network hubs and network connectors. And I've compared that between the different networks Work type. So on the x-axis here, we have each plant species represented by a dot, their importance in the pollination network. So the farther along the x-axis, the more important they are in the pollination network. And then their importance in the herbivory network. So the higher up on the y-axis, the more important they are in the herbivory network. And what we found here is these distinct clusters corresponding to, in the orange here, plant species that are only important and relatively important in the pollination network and not in the herbivory network. And then a cluster of plants that are only important in our herbivory network, but not so much in the pollination network. And so what does this tell us? Well, what this means is that when considering just one interaction type corresponding to one Lepidoptera life stage, so our adults, our, our caterpillars, we're missing a substantial proportion of plant species that are important over the course of the entire Lepidoptera life cycle. And so again, I'm led to the same conclusion that effective Lepidoptera conservation must include protecting native nectar and host plants. The same idea, without the caterpillar, you're not gonna get the butterfly or the moth and vice versa. We have to protect and support both life stages. All right, so for the last part of this talk, I'm gonna explain what I've done to advance these conservation goals and what we can all do to help. And so before I get into the web tool that I've developed, I wanted to outline an important consideration here, which is that California is a huge diverse state. And so which plant species are considered keystone, so these, important, the, these most important plant species in these networks, is gonna vary by location, depending on what species and what interactions are present at that location. And so this may vary latitudinally. We're not gonna have the same species and interactions in Northern California that we get in Southern California. This may vary longitudinally. We're not gonna have the same species on the coast as we do inland. This may also vary ele elevationally. And so what this is telling us is that we need localized results. We can't just take that whole network and say, oh, you know, I'm going to plant a species 
here and that that plant species and your particular location may not be supporting any of your local lepidopter species. And so what I've done to provide these localized results to, to find the most important plant species at each geographic location in California is I provide, I've, I've uh, layered geo-reference plant occurrences, so just GPS points of where each plant species occurs. And I've combined that with the same thing for Lepidopter occurrences. And I've combined that with their interaction data from this data set. And so this can provide us localized results. So it, we're going to find localized networks of interactions between local plants and local Lepidopter at each location in California. And so I've called it the butterfly net. Um, and it's currently hosted on an interface called R Shiny. And so you can access it at this web address. And what I'll do is put this in the chat right now so that you can all jump on and follow along. So all you got to do is press that link and it'll bring you to the page. And hopefully it doesn't crash because too many people are using it. We shall see. So what I'm going to do now is just go through a tutorial on how to use this tool. And and so really, this is a tool that's for use both by conservation and restoration professionals, so at ecological restoration sites or to aid in local lepidopter conservation efforts. But it can also be used, and I want it to be used, by the general public. So we have 50,000 square miles of monoculture lawns in the US. That represents a huge proportion of land, 2% of land in the US that could be converted into native plant habitat that supports our insect populations. So before I get into that, I just wanna real quick thank everyone who's helped me so much on this project, including the Rafferty Lab, Jeffrey Caldwell for the data, people at UCR and CMPS, as well as all of the undergraduate students that have helped me. I'm gonna go through my work cited real quick. So I have a lot of photographs that I'm citing here. And now I'm gonna dive into the app. So I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and jump over to sharing my other screen. And after this, I will jump into questions. All right, so I got disconnected because it timed out, but um, so if you click that link, it should bring you to a page that looks something like this. And so here's the tool. There's some supporting information um, that you can see by cl clicking this button in the top right. And just to let you know, this is a work in progress. Um, I'm not a web developer, so the, the tool is a bit laggy. And I'm working actually with CMPS and Calscape to improve that. Um, but I do appreciate any feedback, any suggestions that you may have while you're using this tool. Um, I'll drop my email in the chat as well later so that you can all send me your questions and comments. I mean, I, I also wanted to mention that there are some errors in this data. So if you notice something that shouldn't be there, um, especially I know a lot of you are, are very good with native plants. So if you notice something that shouldn't be there, please email me and I can go into the data and fix it. All right, so how do we use this tool? Well, on the left-hand side, you'll see that there are a variety of search boxes and we can make some decisions here. So I can focus on finding plants that support butterflies or moths separately, or I can just choose both. And I would recommend choosing both because again, 95% of Lepidopter species are moths and not butterflies. So although people like to plant butterfly host plants and nectar plants so they can see those pretty butterflies during the day. The vast majority of diversity of Lepidopter are moths that we also need to be protecting. And then I can also focus on providing nectar plants or so plants for our adults when they're pollinators, or I can find our host plants, so our plants for our caterpillars. So I'm just going to start out with finding those plants for adults. You can also choose both but choosing adults and caterpillars will limit the list to just those plants that provide resources to both life stage. So the list will be a bit shorter, but you can always find more results by expanding your search radius here. And so I'm gonna start with our adults and I live right near the university here. So I'm just gonna put in my address. Um, you can also 
zoom in on this map and find your address and just click on it. And so I clicked find plants and now I see that I have on my priority plant species tab here, I have a list of what's starting with the top 10 plants that I can plant to support those butterfly and moth pollinators. And I see one of my first plants is actually a milkweed. And so I can actually press on those plant species, their names um, to see the adult, so our adult butterflies and moths that use this plant species as a nectar resource. And we can see this list. I can also click on these and it'll bring me to the Wikipedia article if I wanna see a picture and find more information about those plant species. I can do the same for the Lepidoptera species as well. All right, so this is showing you that, that list of those top 10 plants that you should be planting to support adult butterflies and moths in your yard. I can find more plants if I'm interested by using this number of species to display tool, and that'll just increase the list. The other tab, so let's say I live in an area where there's a threatened or endangered Lepidopter, and by that I mean one that's federally or state listed as threatened or endangered, and there's only 18 species in California, um, and a lot of them are in the Bay Area. But let's say, for example, I live in El Segundo, and I'm using this because I know that there is an endangered butterfly in El Segundo. So I'm gonna hit find plants. You gotta give it some time to do its thing. Um, and so it's gonna now show me that on my threatened or endangered Lepidoptera tab, I have this threatened, uh, I believe it's called the El Segundo blue butterfly. Yep, um, that is again, an extreme specialist, rare subspecies of a butterfly endemic to a small, dune ecosystem in Southern California. And so if I live right near that dune, I think I can provide resources for this endangered Lepidoptera. I can find these plant species that, that will be listed underneath that this Lepidoptera needs, in this case, an Areogonum species. So the last thing I'll show you on these tabs is my networks. So here, again, the same sorts of interaction networks between our plant species on the left and our Lepidoptera species on the right. So if you're interested in, in zooming in on this and seeing how many, um, you know, uh, all the connections of these plants and Lepidoptera in these networks, um, that's there to look at as well. And we have the same thing for the herbivory network. One thing to keep in mind is that, let's say I expand my search radius to 20 miles. So now I'm searching a much larger area. What you'll see is that these herbivory and pollination networks sometimes fail to render because there's just too many species. So that can happen sometimes. So if you're not seeing these networks, so in this case, you can see that it's so large that it deleted the names. Um, so that's not much use. <laughs> um, all right, so one thing I wanted, the next thing I wanted to say is, okay, I just found the plants that are great for our adults, our pollinators. Now I want to, I want to plant some plants in my garden that support these butterflies and moths, but in their larval stage, their caterpillar stage. So I'm just going to change that to caterpillars. I'm going to hit find plants, give it some time, and now it's going to give me that list of the top plant species that I should be planting to support those, those caterpillars in my yard and, or garden. All right, so that's the tool. I hope you all find it useful. One thing I did want to mention is that if you live in a remote location, let's say I live, well, maybe in the San Gabriel Mountains area, if my geography is correct. Um, sometimes there's just not enough data out there um, for plant or lepidopter occurrences in that location. Um, so in this case, actually there is, there, there's a lot of people in Southern California. So people are going up there documenting native plants. But if you ever find that there's blanks in this list, so there's, you know, there's no plant species that are being displayed or an error occurs, what you can do is just increase the search radius and it's gonna expand that search a little bit farther. And so maybe it'll en encompass more of that data and you can find those plant species. All right, so that is it for my talk and the demonstration. Thank you all for listening.
Um, and I guess I can go into answering some of the questions now. So uh, there were not a whole lot of questions. I think everybody was holding them. Um, the one that didn't get answered as you went through your presentation um, was for Brian Cook. Um, and Brian, do you want to ask that question yourself? Yeah, I, I just had a question as you were talking about the light pollution issue. Um, I had just switched all my light bulbs to be 27, uh, 2700K. Is that at, uh, somewhat effective at reducing the issue with the light pollution? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I'm not a light pollution expert, so I'll preface my answer with that. I believe the 2700K refers to the temperature of the light, um, the, the specific range of wavelengths that it encompasses. Um, so really the important thing is we want warmer light. We want um, uh, wavelengths that, um, now I'm forgetting if it's warmer light is shorter wavelengths or higher. Um, I, I forget about that distinction, uh, but yeah. Yeah, the lower number is the warmer light. Yeah, so we, we want that warmer light because um, it's much less attractive to the moths. And they, a lot of recent studies are showing that, that it's really about the temperature or you can call it the color of that light. So blue light is really, really bad for moths. It's also really, really bad for humans. And, and part of the issue right now is that a lot of our lighting in California and across the country is being replaced with these energy efficient LEDs, which is great because they are energy efficient, they'll burn less fossil fuels, but the issue is they're not taking into account how attractive the wavelength of that light is to nocturnal insects. And it turns out that those LEDs are actually a lot more attractive and therefore a lot more detrimental to moths and other nocturnal organisms. So, so yeah, in terms of moth conservation, the important thing is not using those blue lights, those, uh, those um, cooler temperature lights. And so if you've done something to reduce that, then I think it's, it's a great step in the right direction. And then uh, Stephen Kucher had a question. Yes, I'm going to start off with light and then get into heavy. But um, uh, one of my, one of my, and I try not to be too long because you've opened up such a large subject, which mm. has so many ramifications. But watching moths pollinate fl native plants at night under full moonlight is one of the neatest things that I've experienced without any external light. My question, my first little question is, when you did, when you collected moths and analyzed the pollen, did you do a study to see whether pollen was transferred from one moth to another in that small container? Yeah, that, that's a really excellent question. So I have not conducted that study. It's still in my plans if I get around to it. Um, but part of the reason um, that I'm not super concerned about that is because other groups have studied that in very similar traps. So they've done experiments where they've introduced like sterile lab reared moths introduced them to those traps which with a bunch of wild moths and then took them back out and see and seen if any of the pollen transferred to them and there's very low low amounts of pollen transfer in these traps um, and there's several studies that if you're interested I could I could point you to um, so yeah I'm not it's not something that I'm overly worried about but I will tell you that um, there are some nights out there where I, I can't really use the data because the buckets will just be like chock full of moths. Um, it's, we, we have an abundance problem, so which is the op, which is actually a great thing. We have tons of moths out there, but um, it, it could potentially be problematic for that research. Yeah, I, I would expect that. Now here are the harder ones. First, there's migration. So you could, 
I have a butterfly garden. I promote everything you've done, everything you say. I think it's good. But here's the problem that I find. You don't know where the moths and butterflies are going. You can't track individual moths. So you plant a butterfly garden and the moths will never find it. So how do you know? So one plan would be to make a grid work of, of areas and get the cities to make plots of land where those plants would be planted. I gave a talk about the land use in Orange County and I used as an example, the number of golf courses versus the number of nature centers. And there were many more golf courses than there were nature centers. Mm -hmm. so, so what bothers me about what you, when you talk about planting these plants is that the moths won't find them. Yes, they're there, but the diversity of plants and also what it really boils down to is land conservation and an overpopulation and land use. And that's what you're really fighting. And so if I'll do last little bit. So if I were going to look at this as a problem and say, I've really got to do this and, and forget about climate change, I would make a plan that because it's not going to work. All the CNPS people will do it. I'll do it. But it's not going to make an impact. Yeah, so um, hopefully I remember everything you talked about there. Um, to that last point, I, I completely agree with you in one respect that um, a lot of progress is up to our policymakers. Um, you know, as you know, even as scientists, and especially as you know, your average citizen, at the end of the day, is it really going to matter what we do in our backyards if the broader policies that are governing our whole lives are completely against that cause? Um, and so, a lot of yeah, a lot of it, a lot of the solution is in the hands of our policymakers. Um, but in that regard, like I said, those stats about how much of our land is in the hands of private citizens' yards that are mostly monoculture lawns. So we have a tremendous amount of land out there that could be used for some sort of conservation, whether it's just planting native plants, the simplest thing you can do, um, that could be used for some sort of conservation um, and, and put towards that goal. So I, I do think that you know the the general public has a role to play. We can all be doing something to help and we all should be um, because at, at the end of the day, it's gonna require more than our large protected areas because we've already protected all the land we really can in the US. Now we need to start focusing on that land that hasn't already been set aside in our huge, our huge you know, national parks and stuff. And a lot of that land are our yards and gardens in, in people's on people's properties. So um, yeah, and then so circling back to the first thing that you asked about, um, you know, these these butterflies and moths not being able to find these plants, um, I'd recommend looking at the work of Doug Talmy again. He is he uh, in the talk that Orchid referenced in the beginning here. Um, he talked about how on his property, he, um, you know, planted a bunch of these native plant species that he knew supported certain Lepidopter species. And it did take, in some cases, several years for those species to find those plants. Um, and that's probably the reality, you know, they're, that's not going to happen overnight. But if we build up these areas with our native plants, over time, we will see that these species are going to start using them. And it's going to be less of an urban matrix of inhospitable habitat to them. And they're going to see it more as potential habitat and potential resources that they can use. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answered some of your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. OK, uh, Ty also mentioned that they have a question regarding influx of non-native insects. Yeah, um, I was at a job site today, and one thing I did was turn over a lot of uh, boards and just found nothing but earwigs. And uh, I was also noticing earwigs up in flowers, 
<laughs> and I was just wondering about, you know, various non-native insects and how, how have you had any uh, findings of interactions uh, with the non-native insects and the reductions of the native uh, insects? Yeah, so, so yeah, native species um, are one of the causes of decline in our native insects. So um, I'm not sure about earwigs. I, I know nothing about earwigs, but, but yeah, if, if these are invasive, you know, non-native species that are coming in, that always represents the potential that that species is taking resources away from our native species. And so, so in terms of insect decline, it's, it's one of the causes and it's, it's not a good thing. Um, invasive plants too, you know, provide, not providing resources to our, to our native insects. Um, it, my experience with invasive species is actually in this data set. And if you, if you know a lot about Lepidoptera, you may be able to help me here if anyone in the audience does. Um, there, there are some invasive or non, at least non-native Lepidoptera species that are included in this data set and I'm trying to get rid of them. Um, so, so yeah, there are, uh, in the case of Lepidoptera too, there are there are non-native species that are here using native plant resources because they're interacting with these native plants in the data set, um, but potentially taking those resources away from our native moth and butterfly species. Um, are you finding that a lot of those are, are generalists or are they more like Gulf fritillaries, which are extremely specialized to also a non-native plant that's usually in gardens? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, generally, what I know about global change, um, you know, the the broad scale changes that are happening across the earth is that generalists are usually the winners. Um, and so a lot of our invasive species that are able to take over landscapes, um, and plants are a great example of this, are, are some ecological generalists in one sense or another. So plants that can just use a variety of different habitat types or substrates or resources or soil types. Um, those are the ones that are often able to thrive. And I suspect the same is true for insects. So, um, you know, because they're able to thrive in so many different conditions, they're probably more likely to take over in any kind of foreign landscape. Um, so yeah, I don't know for sure um, in terms of Lepidoptera. I know we have some invasive like tussock moths that, that undergo huge outbreaks in our forests on the West Coast, um, but, but I'm not sure if, if they're particularly specialized or not. Okay, uh, Rebecca Lotta had something that might be a question, might be a comment. Um, she was uh, asking about, what about asking Edison and similar utilities to plant some of these species in their right of ways? They connect cities and are often acres in size. And currently they are mostly non-native invasive grasses. Yeah, that, that's an excellent idea. I, I know some graduate students actually um, that are working on projects like that. Um, um, they're kind of projects that are half policy and half you know, ecology and science where you have to engage the policymaker because you can't secure rights or access to that land unless you talk to the company, you talk to the policymakers. Um, but yeah, that's that represents just like people's yards and gardens, that represents a huge potential land um, area that we can use to plant native plants. Um, and so I think, I think that definitely should be done. Um, again, whether it can be done will come down to whether the company or the policymakers allow it. So I think we definitely need more people on that side because a lot of conservation can't be done unless we get people on our side and that requires communication and stuff like that that scientists are often not very good at. <laughs> um, uh, also, Robin Matthews uh, had a related question. Um, she says that she's working on a pollinator highway in Laguna Canyon. And she asks, is distance between gardens or other uh, clusters of habitat an issue? Yeah, so, so the previous question actually also relates to this is that is the idea that connection is super important in conservation. Um, 
So you may be familiar with the idea of habitat corridors. Um, and the whole reason that we want to build those corridors that connect our protected areas is because a lot of species just can't get from one place to another unless they have continuous habitat to travel in. Um, and so there's, there's several very famous studies that have demonstrated um, with butterflies in meadow habitats that connection is super, super important. Um, so, so I would suspect that yes, the distance between the yards, whether there's any sort of habitat that can act as a stepping stone between those yards, um, generally connection is better. Um, and so very isolated patches of habitat, species are gonna be, have a harder time traveling between those, um, utilizing the resources between those, which is why it's so important that we need, especially in our urban and suburban areas, um, we need more people to convert their yards into native plant habitat um, because we need that connection as much as possible. Okay, thank you so much. Um, next, Barbara Eisenstein had some questions about native versus non-native plants for this. Hi. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, this is CNPS. I, I'm involved in CNPS, and I also am. Uh, I have seen many of Doug Ptolemy's talks, and I'm a great advocate for planting native plants. However, that is not without controversy as, as is always the case in science in particular. And I know that there's a, a man named Art Shapiro and some people who work on pollinator more, I think it's more bees um, up in the Bay Area in Berkeley, uh, Gordon Frankie, who, who suggests that, um, that this distinction may be more nuanced uh, and that having a very um, uh, sort of uh, rigid maybe rigid is, I don't know if that's the right word, um, policy of only going with natives may not be the best way to go when we're talking about species. And the thing that comes to mind are, are, is milkweed and the issues we've seen with the disease OE and tropical milkweeds. But if you look at this and really, uh, you know, I think get into the weeds, um, I, I, I manage a nature park and we only plant native milkweed. But by native milkweed, I don't mean just native to our area. I'm talking about also some of the desert milkweeds that we've been trying to get to grow in there. And the fact that that land is now drier and hotter than it had been may require us to move away from, uh, you know, I saw your definition of, uh, of native and I love that definition. That, that's the way to go. Um, but it, it is nuanced. And so as I work in the nature park and I see things like, uh, we have a non-native solanum in there, uh, a nightshade. Do those non-native, and that's weedy and it does get out of control, do those native plants, uh, non-native plants provide habitat to some of the specialists who, you know, it, it, there must be some crossover. Do we have any handle on this? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting um, and, and cool information uh, that you're working on. Uh, yeah, so to answer your question, there, there are many different aspects of, you know, and resources in the environment that, that any given organism relies on. And if we look at Lepidoptera, you have the, the caterpillars that need to eat something. And so if, if we just focus on that, then the answer is probably that non-native plant species is probably not providing good resources for those native species. Um, you know, there, there may be species here and there that can eat it, um, but generally, again, non-native plants are not providing good resources for caterpillars. But if we look at other aspects of that organism's life history, so let's jump to the adult stage. That butterfly or moth may be able to use the nectar from that non-native plant. Um, but it's probably going to be less attractive to it. And so there's been studies mm -hmm. showing that even though those flowers contain nectar, the native butterflies and moths or other pollinators are just not going to be as attracted to those flowers. Um, but again, it, it, it's probably better than nothing um, in terms of that. And then you have, you know, like, Again, jumping back to the, the Lepidopter life cycle, you have, they need a, butterflies need a place to put their chrysalis. Um, you know, that, that 
non-native plant could probably provide that habitat as well. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so th there's a lot of different aspects that go into it. There, you know, moths like to live in, in dead leaves and stuff. I don't really know if it matters what types of dead leaves they are. Um, I don't know if anyone's even studied that, but I suspect that that doesn't matter as much as those host plants that the caterpillars sometimes absolutely need to survive. And that's why it's really important for Lepidoptera in particular to plant those host plants because for a lot of species, you know, you can have a million plants out there. If they don't have those one or two native plants that they need sure. to survive, they're not going to, they're not going to make it. Um, so, so, so going back and looking at the example of the tropical milkweed, which is a non-native milkweed, and it seems to, to result in certain disease issues for monarch butterflies. You know, if we manage that, I don't do this, um, but it's much easier to grow tropical milkweed than it is to grow narrow leaf milkweed. Um, and it has been suggested that if you cut the tropical milkweed back so that its life cycle mimics our native milkweeds, um, that you would then deal with that issue of, of OE spreading among these non-migrating monarchs. Um, so so what, what I'm asking here is, are, are people looking at this, at this issue, because it's nuanced, uh, you know, there, it's not just native and non-native, it's native where, it's, you know, it's a complicated picture. And that's why, you know, when in my planting, I really try to think about it more of a community way and not target monarchs or this or that, but to look at it as a group of plants that have typically grown together. But are people looking, it, you know, like we have uh, we have bed straw in there, which is a non-native weed. Well, there are native bed straws. Mm -hmm. Is the non-native bed straw providing any of the resources that the native would have? That is not in my nature part. Are people looking at these non-natives I'm not talking about like mustard or something that just totally takes over and really ruins the whole uh, ecosystem. Are people looking at these, uh, some non-native plants that seem to just be happier and easier? Yeah, so I think a lot of research goes into that. Um, unfortunately, like I said, the results are, are almost always that the native plants are better in that particular. Mm -hmm. um, but with that being said, um, you know, there, there is something to be said, especially when we're trying to argue this to, you know, the general public. There's a reason why we plant the, the cultivated plants, the ornamental plants that we do in our yards and gardens. A lot of times it's because they, well, aesthetic, aesthetics is a big, a big mm -hmm. push for landscaping, but sometimes it's because for the reasons that you said, they grow easier, they're easier to maintain, um, stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I, I see and agree with a lot of the arguments of why we should be using native plants for those same reasons. You know, they, they can be lower maintenance, they require less pesticides, um, they're more water efficient. So I, I think to me, the arguments for native plants far outweigh the arguments against them. But I think there also needs to be a way to reconcile that with the general public. You know, you're not going to commit mm -hmm. everyone to plant an entire yard full of native habitat and species that evolved together and it's a perfect, you know, wild habitat. It's not going to happen. And so I think if we can focus our efforts, and that's kind of what I've been trying to do with this tool, is just showing, you know, people a couple of those really important species that they could plant instead of mm -hmm. that introduced tree or whatever it is um and so mm -hmm. yeah, I think, but yeah i i'll i'll think more about that question about the value of non-native plants because i think that is interesting um, or, or even not locally native but i i do want to say uh the incredible tool that website I, i'm very excited i can't wait to uh, really dive in and thanks. plant more of those plants in in our nature park in my garden so thank you yep thank you And there were two more questions that I think might be relatively quick to answer. Um, George Zhang asked, in terms of metamorphosis, the moth goes through a cat co cocoon stage, but the butterfly doesn't, correct? And that was his question. OK, yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's kind of semantic. So they, butterflies and moth, moths both go through a pupil stage. 
Usually for butterflies, we call it a chrysalis. Usually for moths, we call it a cocoon. Um, there's a third term in there that now I'm forgetting. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, it's the same stage. It's the pupil stage, but um, cocoons are often more silk-like. Um, and, and moths often actually pupate underground. So our, our native hawk moths dig underground and pupate underground and then emerge. Butterflies often will pupate um, on plant by attaching to plants and stuff like that. And then the other quicker question um, from Barbara, Barbara Sattler, would wind such as the Santa Ana's be a way for Lepidoptera to travel? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so I did some research in Costa Rica um, before I entered graduate school. Um, and, and the main finding was that wind like very much influences where and when butterflies and moths uh, uh, are active. Um, and so they, they're very affected by wind um, because they have large wing surface areas and they can easily be blown off course. So what I've seen in my research is that they often choose not to fly as much in the wind, um, probably because it's harder for them to navigate. Um, but with that being said, I know for birds at least, wind can actually help in migration. And, and I'm pretty sure I remember reading about the same thing for butterflies. So they actually take advantage of winds, these species that, that have long migration routes um, and that wind can actually help them. Um, but yeah, I don't, don't know uh, a ton about that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, most of the other comments all throughout this have been about thanking you and how wonderful the, uh, the uh, website tool is. Um, there's a lot of folks saying thank you so much in various ways. So if you want to read through them. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. I really, I really appreciate you coming and listening, and I really appreciate all your comments. Um, and like I said, if if you use the tool, if you notice anything wrong, if you have any suggestions um, or any other sort of feedback, I'd love to hear it. I'm gonna toss my email in the chat right now, so feel free to shoot me an email. Oops, I messed up the last should be .edu, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, there's my email. Um, and yeah, thanks again, thanks for inviting me, really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone has fun planting those butterfly and moth gardens. Well, thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you May 26th for the next meeting.